At Calvary, the people aren't fighting a war on drugs. They're fighting addiction. And their biggest weapon is faith. But why can't drugs and faith coexist? There's no communication with God through, through the means of, of, a, of a substance. The only way the Bible speaks to get reconciled to God and have communication with Him, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. What about, like, uh, for instance, uh, Native American tribes uh, who actually use drugs to, f in the, at least in their terms, find God? A lot of times what people have done in history is they've even used um, mind-altering substances, which the Bible would refer to as, in some translations, witchcraft, some translations, sorcery. Here's the Christian perspective. Yeah. This is it, in a nutshell. Right. You don't have so much of a drug and alcohol problem right. as you do a worship problem. We switch God for an idol. And, and here's the thing, Dean. With and the me, idol is sometimes alcohol or drugs, yeah. is what you're saying. And Dean, when I pass by a liquor aisle in a yeah. store, what do I see? A sanctuary with idols. Alcohol is the result of grain and yeast interacting with sugars in a process called fermentation. It's the most popular drug in the world. And today, about 140 million people suffer from alcohol-related disorders. So are there any biblical figures who speak about drug abuse specifically? One of the best you can go to would be uh, the Apostle Paul, who dedicated his whole life to Christ, wrote much of the New Testament. He says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, here's some, he says, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, sorcery, idolatry, false gods never satisfy real spiritual needs. You can chase that all you want. You will always come back broken, shattered, and, 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 and crawling. This morning we are starting a brand new series called Worship Junkies. That's right, Worship Junkies. You're not going to want to miss one part of this series is going to run for the next four weeks. This morning, before we dive in, tell you what it's all about. We're going to pray. Go bow your head. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your presence that fills this place. God, thank you for the opportunity, God, that we have to come into your house, God, and freely worship you. And together, God, open your word and learn together. God, I pray today that you would um, just bring your word to life. God, I pray that you would help us to understand the words on the page. God, I pray that today we would speak the words from your heart to your people. God, let it challenge and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, uh, I had uh, a half-brother, but he was like my real brother. Uh, he lived in Dallas, Texas, uh, my whole life. Um, and he would come up in the summer times, and man, we would just have a blast. His name was Sean, and Sean was one of these guys, he could, he could just walk in a room, and, I mean, the party has, has begun. I mean, he walks in a room and there's just, it's electric, and he is like, he's known you for 10 seconds, and you guys are best friends, and you just think the world of this guy. He is just loud and proud and awesome. And he was also just an incredible, incredible athlete. This guy was like 6'2", and like 285 pounds, and run a five-minute mile. He was insane, stacked with muscle. The dude was amazing. He was a beast on the football field. He uh, he got um, you know he was he was also very very smart academically. Uh, by the time he was kind of coming to the end of his college career at William Jewell University in Kansas City, uh, the Chiefs were looking at him to, to play ball, but uh, there was a little hang up with them being able to to really move forward with the process. He had a drinking problem. He. He got into his fraternity, and, and man, I'm telling you what, the, the party began and it never, ever, ever stopped. He actually got so heavy into alcohol that he dropped out of college one semester before graduating with a business degree. He moved back to Texas and got married and had a child. And from that point forward, he, he really never aspired to, to really maximize the potential that he had. Uh, he was an incredibly smart, very, very talented guy, but he really never, ever accomplished what he could have accomplished. And, you know, he really never stopped drinking. He just kept drinking and drinking and drinking. And that really became his lifestyle to the point to where, um, you know, he would have vodka stashed just anywhere, uh, anywhere you can imagine. In the towel closet under the seat of his car, he lived on this stuff like it was, like it was water. And uh, it, it seemed like for Sean, you know, uh, he wasn't really content or happy unless he was drunk. 
And um, I don't say that disrespectfully towards my brother whatsoever because I, I love him to pieces. And I say love because he actually passed away uh, with a heart attack. He drank himself to death. And we found him after three days of being dead in his living room floor because he was just toxic with alcohol. Life just completely destroyed because of addiction. And, um, you know, you and I, we all know of, of people whose lives have been dramatically, tragically impacted by addictions, by substances, by alcohol and or by drugs. And, you know, I myself have never been addicted to any sort of substance. I know Misty has not. But we know a lot of people, especially as pastors, we've met a lot of people who have had a lot of experience just being in the darkest, deepest moments of those addictions. And it's, it's difficult. It is so extremely hard to dig your way out of those addictions. And I know for many that we've talked to, it is their go-to. It, it is the place where they can go and they, they can just... They can just wipe their worries away. They can go to a place where they just forget everything. The, the, the pain is just numbed over you know, by, by, the, uh, by the intoxication or, or by the high that they're experiencing that moment. And it, it is their escape. It gets to this point to where it's like, I have to have this because I want to experience that. I want to get to that place where I just don't care. Nothing matters. I can't feel any hurt. I can't feel any pain. It is my go-to, right? You guys know what I'm saying. It's an addiction. And, you know, today's message in this series is not really at all about substance abuse or about addictions. But it is about being what many of us know as being a junkie. Someone who is completely overtaken and addicted by some sort of thing or some sort of substance. And you know, when you think about it, we really, we really can't be too hard on people that have, whose lives have been overtaken by these substances because really what they're longing for is they're longing for hope. They're longing for some sort of fulfillment, some sort of happiness. They want to escape. But think about it though, don't we all want that? Don't, don't we all want to escape the pain of our lives? Don't we all just not want to feel the hurt that comes with just doing life? Isn't life hard? Don't we really just want peace to surround our lives? Don't we want comfort? Don't we want to feel like they're like, like, like we just can't feel it anymore and we can just kind of get away? All of us want to get to that place. Some of us just deal with it differently than others. What do you do? Because all of us have a go-to. What is your go-to? Or should I say, who is your go-to? We all run to something. When we get pressed, when we get crushed, when, when, when the chaos of life just comes crashing down on us, we all go to something. What is your go-to? It, it might not be methamphetamines, right? Maybe it's pornography. Maybe maybe it's uh, it's going to uh, you know going for a drive or, or or venting to a friend or maybe it's turning on the TV just so you can let your mind just kind of escape from everything. Maybe it's going to social media. It's, it's habits. We all go to something to just kind of unwind, if you will. We all go to something. But here's the deal. Really what we're longing for in that moment when we're wanting that place of, of rest and comfort is we're wanting really wanting heaven. When you think about it. There's no other place that we can go to to experience what we're talking about today than heaven. And it's really not even, if you want to dig a little bit deeper than that, it's really not even heaven. What? It's not really heaven. It's God's presence. Because heaven without God's presence would just be a place. It's really about being in God's presence. It's really about 
kind of going to his throne room, if you will, and escaping from all of the mess of this crazy, crazy life. But you see, Satan has used these things, methamphetamines and alcohol and these different sort of drugs because he wants to deceive, he wants to convince people, he wants to dupe them into believing that they can escape to this place and everything is going to be just fine. But when all the smoke clears, their lives have been totally and completely destroyed because his job is to emulate or mimic those things that God has created but use it for the destruction of humanity because he hates God and he hates you. That's the truth. So, the Bible says in Psalm, Psalms 84 and verse 10, it says, A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. You know what the writer is talking about in this passage? He understands, he gets the idea of the importance and the power of being in God's presence. He gets it. He gets it. You see, hell, hell is, is, is it, it's not horrible because... It's a fiery inferno, the darkest of, of, of the darkest of places in existence. It, it's not the worst place ever because of the, the worm that never dies or the demons that will hiss and, and haunt and, and taunt you for all of eternity. It's not any of that. Hell is hell because God's presence is void from that place. An eternity outside of God's presence is hell. That's what makes it so very, very bad and intolerable. Because we were wired to be in God's presence. And that avenue by which we can get to His presence is called worship. You know, you may have grown up in church or maybe you didn't. Maybe this is your first time to ever step foot in four walls that we call a church where we have corporate worship services, if you will. Maybe you've heard that word worship, and maybe you don't fully understand what we mean when we say <coughs> worship. <coughs> when we say worship, we're not just talking about singing songs. We're not just talking about giving our offering, although those are forms of worship. We're not just talking about serving in kids' ministry or holding a door, although all of those are forms of worship. <clears throat> Having no electric and camping like did a number on me. Camping to me is a bad hotel, so no power for two days. <laughs> That's me. I'll tell you that right now. I'm a wuss. No, I, I didn't even complain. It was awesome. But let me tell you, what is true worship? We're going to explain what a junkie is. And you know, it's a sad commentary when we talk about junkies of the world. It is a really sad commentary. Normally, when we think junkie, we think world. We think just like Sean, who we love dearly and pray for him every day of his life, who couldn't kick a habit that got control of his life because that became his go-to. But what is a worship junkie? Let me tell you one definition of worship, and I love this. Worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. Worship let me read it again. It's to honor. What is to honor? Honor is to respect. Same word. With extravagant love and extreme submission. To worship God is to love Him so much. To adore Him to the point of complete and total surrender and submission of your life. It's not something that just happens when we walk through these doors and we enter a worship service. It is something that happens 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Does that mean you go around singing? I hope not. That would be annoying. If you say 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, all of us would be like, that is enough, right? My son talks nonstop. If he's 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, my oldest, he talks. 
And I'll tell you, just hearing somebody talking all the time is like, you have to stop now. You, you have to. God doesn't necessarily want you to sing all the time. He wants your life to emulate a person who is so in love with him that your life is a life of submission. Now, out of that comes action. Out of that deep, extravagant love and that attitude of complete and total submission comes action. Let me tell you, worship is a verb. It is what you do. Junkie is a noun. It is who you are. All right? So listen to me. If you are a worship junkie, you, your attitude and your actions are displaying or doing something, and you are a junkie, which means you are addicted to God's presence. God wants his people to be worship junkies. He wants you to go to him. A lot of times in our minds, we think because we live in America, we live in the home of the free, that we can just come to church. Man, we, we have a beautiful Bible. Or maybe, maybe we don't even have this anymore. Because we have these, right? And mine's old, right? Don't, don't judge. That's a five. I need to get a new one. We have, we have our Bible. And man, we drive into church in our nice cars or our sweet minivans. And we pull up and we walk in. And we sit down and we get the best cup of coffee we've had all week. And some kind of crazy glaze, something from the food. That there is a French cooler. Cooler. That's a new Sunday tradition. I like it. And we are like, yes, I've done the right thing. I have come to church. And we sit down. And the band strikes it up. And if you're not careful, you're, 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 you know, you're reading the words off the screen and maybe you can sing and maybe you can't. That's why it's loud. It doesn't matter if you can sing or not. We will crank it up to the point that nobody cares. You can That's spell right. it out at the off key and nobody's right. going to know. Always okay? know. But you get in this habit of just coming in and we go through these motions. One song ends and the next one begins. But somehow we make it through without really understanding what we're doing. You see, when we come in and worship begins, that is an opportunity to corporately, as a group, begin to celebrate who God is. It's really not about what God has even done. Because maybe your week has been horrible. Maybe you had no power all week. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you lost a loved one. There can be all kinds of horrible things go on in your life. But that should never affect your attitude of worship. People that you look at who walk in peace, no matter what, are people who have begun to understand what true worship is. They have begun to understand that being addicted to God's presence, that becomes your go-to. You know, when you open to the middle of your Bible, if you have a real Bible rather than an app. If you go to the very middle, there's a book called Psalms. And Psalms is a book that teaches us what worship is all about. You can be going through the worst tragedy of your life, and you can pretty much flip to any page in Psalms and begin to read, and it will speak to your situation. Why? Because the author, David authored so much of the psalm. And King David was a guy who not only was he a musician, an amazing, anointed musician who played a beautiful harp, but God called him to be the king. And when God called him to be the king, last week Brandy preached about King Saul. He came after King Saul. But listen to me. He ran for his life. King Saul, after he wandered away from God, God lifted his hand off of his life and King Saul was tormented by demonic spirits. And he called in David to come and play his part. Now let me ask you a question. Why would King Saul, who's being tormented by demonic spirits, want someone to come in and play a part? Because every time David would play the part, because he was so anointed, God's presence would fill Saul's room. Saul himself couldn't get a hold of God. But David would come in and play. And God's presence would fill that room. But then Saul began to get so angry. 
of the fact that David had the ability to touch heaven and that he had that relationship with God, that he began to go after David and take his life. So David spent much of his life running, running, hiding in caves. You know the song, Refuge. Mitchell sings it. It's an awesome song. You are my refuge. A refuge is nothing more than a hollowed out cave where you can get back in it and find safety. Where nobody else can see you. And when, when David penned those words, God, you are my refuge. He was declaring who God was. Not what he had done for him, but who he was. God, in the middle of somebody trying to take my life, I'm going to run into the cave and I'm going to have a refuge. God, you are my hiding place. You are my go-to. When he became king, he made some really poor choices. And he sinned by committing adultery. And then by committing murder. And you can read then a psalm where he begins to confess his sin and say, God, forgive me. I want to come back in to that same relationship I had with you before. And at the end of his life, God made this comment and he said David is a man after my own heart why would he say that David wasn't perfect but David knew who to go to David knew that his go to was God's presence you see in our life personally as pastors one of the coolest things that we ever got to experience is learning how to tap into God's presence it's not something that you just come in and automatically you're like, woo, like five minutes and we're good to go. Let me tell you something. If you've ever dated someone and tried to woo them over, it doesn't happen in a, mo in a matter of moments. It takes time. And God's presence, God wants you to take time to be in his presence. Psalms 96 and 9 says this. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness and fear before Him all the earth. God wants our life to be a life of worship, to be a life of holiness, for Him to be our go-to. We come to the point, and it's happened over and over and over throughout the course of time, that we feel like a relationship with God is about a certain to-do list. I read my Bible... Check. God, these are all the things that I need today. I mean, my wife, she's driving me crazy. And my kids, they're brats. And my car is a piece of junk. God, you got to help me with all of that. And Lord, bless our finances. God, thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Check. 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 Let me turn on a worship song. What worship song is going? I'm going to go through my to-do list for my day. And off I go. And God says, you, I wanted to speak to you today. I really wanted to tell you something. But God wanted if you didn't give me any time. You, you went through the motions of the things that you know you need to do. I mean, yes, you need to be in my word because I can speak to you through that. Yes, you need to pray. But it's not just about what you want. What about what I want to tell you? Because communication is two-way. It's not just you talking to God, it's God talking to you. I think so often that we are missing it. The Bible says very clearly that in God's presence is the fullness of joy. It's what every addict is looking for. To be full of joy. To have the peace that surpasses all understanding that guards your heart and guards your mind no matter what you're ever facing. Yet we've allowed life and all the distractions to take precedence over God's presence. And you know, we can even get in the habit of spending more time working for God than we do with spending time with God. And God, when He looks down, I don't want Him to look down and say, Man, I got a lot of work for these. They're doing a lot in my name. But man, I miss them. I just want to spend time. I just want them to be in my presence. Right. You know, I want you guys to think for just a minute about the fact that you know, God, our Creator, made you and He made me. 
but why? If you go back to our Easter series, and I encourage you to do that, there's a really powerful, powerful series talking about relationship versus religion. We go back to the very beginning, starting with Adam and Eve. And here's what we find out. Is that God wired you to worship Him. Think about it. I mean, God makes this big, beautiful garden, right? And He, he makes man out of his own image and he crafts man from the dirt and the dust of the ground and breathes life into him. Right? And then we see that, that in the garden they have everything that they need. They have the, they have the vegetables and the, the fruit and, and the, the trees for shade and, and they, they have water, fresh water, everything that they could possibly need including God's presence. The Bible talks about how God came and visited them and it, and it inclines us to believe that this was a regular daily thing where God was speaking to them and visiting them in the garden in the cool of the day. How cool is that? God stops by to visit. Is that not cool? So we see this garden where Adam and Eve are, are hanging out and living in this paradise, hanging out with God. Hanging out with God. Why? To spend time in His presence continually. Most of you know how the story goes. We lose the garden experience because of sin. It all comes crumbling down. And here we are. But long story short, our purpose hasn't changed. There is still inside of you and inside of me, there is this, this innate, this inner wiring, the way we were created, we, each and every one of us, have this, this drawing inside of us. Even for those who are completely far from God, they don't know what it is. And maybe some of you, if you've been there before, and now you're serving God, and you remember what it was like before, you remember that there was this thing inside of you that you were constantly longing for, that, that peace and that comfort and, and that fulfillment, that hope. You were longing for that, that Jesus-shaped void in your life. And now you know what it is. But we were wired to spend time in God's presence. And what's so crazy, what Misty's talking about, is that when you learn to tap into that, I'm telling you guys, I, I'm, I'm talking about a dimension that some of you in this room, I'm confident you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. But I want you to. I want you to know what I am talking about. I'm talking about a spiritual high like you have never experienced in your entire life. I'm talking about tapping into the presence of Almighty God. Next week, don't miss next Sunday, we're going to talk about how to tap into His presence. How to experience what I'm talking about. What I want to tell you today, though, is you need what I'm talking about I am telling you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're scratching your head right now, you don't know what I'm talking about. You haven't experienced it yet. But I'm telling you, God has a deeper dimension that He wants you to experience with Him. It's called relationship. And it comes by being in His presence. And when you get in His presence, the Bible says in Psalm 16 and verse 11, it says... You will show me, God, the way of life. How many of you guys are lacking life in your life? Right? Listen to me. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence. And the pleasures of living with you forever. Don't, don't get distracted. By the job and the house and the car and raising the family and breathing oxygen and then dying. Don't get distracted by that thing that we think is life. Really, really, truly, we are wired to be in God's presence. If you don't like worship, you ain't going to like heaven. Because there's going to be a whole lot of worshiping going on at the throne room of God. Worshiping Him for eternity. Eternity! There's not going to be earplugs. 
I don't think so, because I think that we all will be able to sing, well, quite well. Uh, but the music is going to be jamming. It's going to be unbelievable. And I'm telling you right now, that you get the revelation, you look about how the angels, there are angels, guys! They are assigned in the throne room of God to fly around the throne constantly singing praises. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And they are saying that, repeating that over and over and over and over and over. Why? Because He is worthy. And that is the word worship. Worth-ship. He is worthy of our attention and our love and our affection, our adoration, our praise, everything that we are. He wants us to channel to Him. What is your go-to? When Misty and I figured this thing out called worship, when we figured this thing out called God's presence, we became junkies immediately. And we realized that we could do without His presence. And once we learned how to tap into it, and there is a trick to it, once we learned how to access His presence, that is our immediate go-to. You think as pastors, you think we have a perfect life? Do you think we don't experience pain? Do you think we don't experience stress? You think that we don't experience heartache or troubles or challenges? You are mistaken. We experience a lot, a lot of storms in our life. The difference between us and the average person is that we understand how to access the presence of God. And we run! We run! We run! into God's presence immediately. When we experience fear, when we experience trouble of any sort, we run into God's presence because in His presence is fullness of joy beyond all measure. I don't know what it's like to be addicted to a substance and I pray for those who are, that they would be broken from that. They would be healed from that. But I'm telling you guys, I am addicted to God's presence. I love, love, love being in His presence. And He wants you to join Him there. I want to tell you a story as we close today. There's a man by the name of Matt Redmond. Some of you may know who he is. He was a worship leader in England. And he was at his church and his pastor made this very, very bold announcement, this very bold declaration. He said, I feel like God, is, as a church, God wants us to see if we can experience Him in a way different than just bringing Him music on Sunday mornings. Let's figure out a way to access His presence without music. And Matt said, well, there goes my job. Because that's, that's what he did. He was the music director, so now there's no music. And during that very, very, almost desertous time, if you will, in Matt's life, it gave him time to really think and, and, and really, really meditate on why he does what he does. And, and, and what is it about, how can we access his presence without all the smoke and the lights and the projector and, and the, the instruments and all this stuff? What is it really about when you take all of the bells and whistles away? What is it really, really about? It's coming back to the heart of worship. You know what's really cool? How cool our God is? He loves you so much that He orchestrated all of this today. Randy made mention of this song in today's offering. This song was popular in 2000. No, in 1998-99. It was the most popular worship song ever. 
Think about how many years have gone by since then. She referenced a pretty old song today. She had no idea that this was going to be the closing remarks of today's message. She had no idea that we were going to conclude today's service with that song. What does that tell me? God's wanting to get our attention. I, when I, during our time of worship, and I love this church because, man, we love to worship. But as I'm standing here behind this keyboard so many Sunday mornings, I can't help but to just watch and see how people are engaging with God. And it's, it becomes very evident to me that there are some who get it. And then there are some innocently that haven't got it yet. And God's heart right now for this series is that we all get it. The glimpse of heaven that God wants you to experience is tapping into His presence. Would you stand up with us as they bring the lights down? This morning I want you to just close your eyes. You may have heard this song before. Maybe this is the first time. Rather than trying to even sing, if you know it, you can sing it. But I want you to focus on the words of this song. These altars are open if you want to come. You want to express your worship to God by kneeling and bowing and just pouring out your heart before Him. But today, as your pastors, this is our prayer. This is our prayer over this church. This is God bring us back. God, bring us back to a heart of worship. God, we love technology and we love reaching the masses.
to live for Him, to walk the walk. If you're willing to do that today, I want to offer you salvation that only comes in Christ Jesus. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, on the count of three, and on the count of three, if this is you this morning, you say, Pastor, I want heaven as my home. Will you raise your hand? We're praying. We've been praying for you continually for so long. You are why we do church. It's not only about His presence. It's about His people. That we would lead you into a real and life-changing relationship with Christ Jesus that becomes addictive and contagious. You want that this morning? I'm counting to three. Believing for your hand to go up. And that goes for those of you watching online as well. Here we go. One, two, life change right here. Three, who are you? Raise your hand in this place. Yeah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Repeat this prayer with me if you would, and the entire church is going to join in as they support you in this decision to come to Christ. Father, I love you. And thank you for Jesus. I know that I've sinned. I have built a wall between you and I. Forgive me, God. Cleanse my heart of all unrighteousness. Make me brand new again. I believe in Jesus to be my Savior. I confess Him as Lord of my life. I dedicate from this moment forward. I will live for you, God. According to your word. Surround me with godly people. Make your house my home. In Jesus' name. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, give to our ministry. We've made giving easy here at Mountain Movers Church. If you have your smartphone, just text the number 918-223-8090. Just push in the amount you want to give and push send. It's that easy. If you don't have your smartphone, not a problem. You can mail your giving just as easy to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. Thanks for watching today. Hey, remember, we're dreaming big for you. We'll see you next week.